and welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, Michelle Graves, affectionately known throughout the United States as the original money lady. Since 1976, I have been working with individuals just like you in the areas of estate planning, insurance, real estate, and international finance. And a part of this program's mission is to inform you, my viewers, about financial areas that will equip you to make wise decisions for you and your family. So it is with great delight that I bring to you today a gentleman that I had on earlier uh, who is well established in the marketplace, Michael Milenig, whose offices are in Dayton, Ohio. Just to give you a little bit of background about uh, Mr. Milenig, attorney at law, he uh, is a member of the Ohio State Bar Association Board of Certified Estate Planning, Trust and Probate Specialist. He is a certified estate law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. He is considered a super lawyer um, by his peers uh, in the area of estate planning, and he is also a VA accredited attorney, which is very important for those of you that are veterans that need assistance as well. And today we're going to be continuing our conversation because we just ran out of time the last time about estate planning and our focus today, and this is so very vital for all of you that are seniors and all of you who are children of seniors. And that is, the subject is going to be how to protect your assets from nursing home seizure. Now, let me give you all a discomforting but truthful statistic. Two out of three individuals will spend some time in a long-term care facility. Now, please be aware, viewers, and this happens over and over again, Medicare, which is health care for individuals over the age of 65, uh, is not Medicaid which is an indigent program that uh, has very specific federal guidelines and restrictions and is limited to people that are indigents. You can't have more than, I think the threshold in Ohio is $1,200 a month. But again, as a part of that qualification process, you have to know how this has to work or else many of you are going to find yourselves losing your home your uh, stocks, bonds, investments, etc. The notion of having a legacy for your children and grandchildren just falls apart when you start talking about Medicaid and long-term care without private insurance. So this is the subject today. Please sit down, listen carefully, take notes, and by all means, if you have questions and you need to sit down, Michael J. Milenig is the attorney that I strongly support. How are you today? Very good, thank good you. Good to have you yeah, back. I'm you. so Thanks glad that you yeah. took time out of your schedule sure. to continue our conversation. Where do we want to begin with this issue of nursing homes and assets? Well, let, let's just begin with the basics and make sure everyone understands Medicare, although it does cover normal medical expenses for older people, Medicare does not pay for the nursing home bill. There, there's, there is a limited coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, if you meet the criteria and you're in a nursing home for the first 20 days, it might cover it. And then day 21 through 100, it might continue to cover that. But in the long run, Medicare does not pay your nursing home bill. And that is so misunderstood mm -hmm. because I hear and I've heard over the years uh, because I am a strong proponent of long-term care mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. Reason being because people need it and they use it. Right. But there is so much confusion in the marketplace, uh, Michael, with regard to Medicare mm -hmm. versus Medicaid. So, would you continue to elaborate? Well, yeah, the, the, the Medicaid program, normally people think of that as, as someone who, who's poor or has some other type of program mm -hmm. that, that, that they go on Medicaid. But in fact, Medicaid pays half of all nursing home bills o overall. So, it, it's a major source of payment for the, the nursing home industry. And that's what people, I think the national statistic is the average person goes into a nursing home and then six months later, they're on Medicaid. That is stunning. 
And that's very, very, very troubling, particularly in today's economic climate where, uh, as I understand it, the Medicaid program is a federal state program. Correct. It, okay. it, it's a little unusual because we have federal programs like uh, Medicare or Social Security, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all run by the federal government. So if you want to apply for benefits, you, you're talking to a federal agency. But uh, Medicare, uh, or I'm sorry, Medicaid program, so we have uh, federal money and a federal agency, and Congress passes laws, but each state actually administers and runs the program. And, and their, by their, do they have their own guidelines, or are well, they under it, federal mandates? It's kind of a mix. Yeah, there, there are federal mandates, so for the most part, they're required to follow federal law, but there's a lot of areas where the, each state is allowed to make certain choices and have differences, and uh, more importantly, since they're administering it, mm -hmm. they interpret it and do things the way they want to. <laughs> so we really have 50 different Medicaid programs, and it's important to understand that uh, you know, you can go on the internet and get all kinds of information. Right. It, so it's scary, it, it, yeah, actually. Yeah. It's all kinds yeah. of information. And, but but if it's not, in terms of Medicaid, it needs to be specific to your state because if, if mm -hmm. you're just looking at something general, uh, it, it might not be correct for Ohio. Mm hmm. So, given the fact that, and I was doing some research on this Medicaid issue, and frankly, Medicaid is bankrupting the budget. Mm -hmm. for the state of Ohio. Yeah. It well, is a large yeah. portion of our, our, the revenues that are coming in, a large portion of that is going to pay for Medicaid uh, recipients. Right, and, and, and politically that's a big, Medicaid is a huge budget issue and uh, I don't have any solution. My job as an attorney know, is to advise people, so I don't have any right. budget advice or solutions. My job is just to figure out what the law is and advise people. Right. But, but yeah, it is a big budget problem. Right. Well, I, I can only conclude that as we go deeper into this business cycle in terms of declining revenues, Medicaid is going to be more and more and more targeted as an area for cutbacks. And that's why this subject matter today is so very important. And right. from, from where I stand as right. an advisor, um, you're saying that usually and typically within six months of a person going into a, a nursing home uh, facility for long-term care purposes, mm -hmm. that they are penniless. Well, that's like a nationwide kind of average Stat, okay, right. right. Well, if you look at $9,000 a month, Mm -hmm. as being the average, average cost, mm -hmm. not including Alzheimer, which is a more expensive type of a right. process, um, $54,000 goes fast. Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. 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 And then they've liquidated everything and they have nothing. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, they're technically bankrupt and are qualifiable, potentially, mm -hmm under Medicaid guidelines. Yeah. Well, the, the basic rule in Ohio is if your total uh, assets or resources are below 1,500, then you're eligible. Okay. There's a lot more to it than that. There's right. all kinds of other rules above that, like your, uh, for a married couple, if the uh, spouse, we call that person the community spouse, mm -hmm. is still living in the home, the home is exempt. And one car for the community spouse is exempt. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that's kind of beyond the $1,500. There's, you know, you don't always have to get down to exactly 1500 There's other things that are exempt above that. Well, I want to talk about this because uh, in Cincinnati, there was a uh, I-Team, Channel 9 I-Team uh, investigation about a couple. Um, and it was a, it's, it's on Internet, and it is very troubling because this couple, she had um, a surgery, major surgery, where a major incision was made in um, in the middle of her body, mm -hmm. and uh, deep uh, it was a deep wound, mm -hmm. and essentially, and I'm just constructing this, um, the hospital wanted to discharge her, mm -hmm. and um, she did not want to go into a facility for uh, care for mm -hmm. long-term care because it was not it was related to the surgery the procedure. Mm -hmm but the long-term care component is not covered by Medicare. Mm -hmm. She needed to have around-the-clock care. Mm -hmm. And she was unwilling, and this was what she said, 
uh, she was unwilling to sign over the house. Now, she's married. The husband is in the home. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said uh, she was unwilling to, to sign over the home. So they, he was now responsible, Michael, for her care. And they showed on television him actually covering his hands with gloves mm -hmm. and doing wound healing, yeah. going inside uh -huh. of her. And, uh, and it was just like, this is the most horrible thing. Mm -hmm. But... The thing that shocked me, and re the reason I know something was not right with this as we're looking at it, is there's no way if she went into a facility that they would take their home under the community spouse provisions for the state of Ohio. Yeah. So how did that information get communicated? Well, it's, it's hard for me to... Yeah. Can't say for sure telling all the facts, but it sounds like that she was, she and her husband were just afraid they were going to lose everything, which is generally mm -hmm. correct. But um, so based on that fear, in, instead of, instead of seeing an elder law attorney, right. just went home. Uh, but yeah, but the, the home would have been exempt. That's what so, I, and yeah. I, I know in my own private practice, I can't, I was so shocked. And this has been, I mean, you can go on the internet and, and, and see this. It's, mm -hmm. it's a horrific, horrific story. Mm -hmm. And the response from the public was outrage, and mm -hmm. this is terrible, and this is unconscionable. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, it's Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And if you find yourself in that type of a situation, mm -hmm. then this could potentially happen. Sure, and uh, you know, it, again, I don't know all about their situation, but uh, she, she should have just gone to an elder law attorney and gotten, instead of just being afraid and not knowing what's gonna happen, gotten some more answers. I would right. think that person could have found some more options. Well, they, they pleaded to the public. They, I mean, the program aired. The response was just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got nurses volunteering to come to the house yeah. to provide care and a lot of all of these support systems mm -hmm. are now coming to the table. But the truth of the matter is, Michael, as you and I both know, this happens every day. Mm -hmm. Every day, True. people are having to make decisions mm -hmm. and families mm -hmm. about Medicaid. Sure. And, and, and if they're not willing or able to take care of that parent or loved one, mm -hmm then those decisions are now upon them. Yeah. What would you yeah. normally recommend? Well, let me, let me mention, this. You, you kind of bring up an important issue about the home. People want to stay home. Whether, yeah, they do. Whether, they're, whether they need care or not, your issue is a care issue, but either, people want to stay home. No, we want, no one wants to go to a nursing home. And, and that's always uh, people's goal. And there are a lot of times when people do, uh, you kind of bring up the point, well, why can't the family take care of them? Um, ideally, you, you would have your family take care of you, but the, some people don't have uh, children don't have or, or other family that can do it, or they do, but their kids are in New York or California. Yeah. And then some people do have a family member that take care of them, but, you know, to do that day in and day out, 24-7, for maybe somebody has Alzheimer's where you just have to be there. Right. You're not doing nursing type care, but you just have to be there. That's a, a real strain. Um, and then sometimes people do have... Uh, real medical needs where they really need skilled care and for mm -hmm. someone to do that it, it's it's just not even possible or, or extremely burdensome and so uh, and I never I have family members I like, discuss the issue with I never tell people not to do it mm -hmm. I, I would never want to tell that to anybody but I say well go ahead and try that and uh, see how and it just, works and you know mm -hmm. and after a while if it if it's not working then then we look into going to a nursing home that's why we have nursing homes right you know, right then, right so Right, yeah. because frankly, in the early stages of Alzheimer, I think families can come together and support, mm -hmm. but the condition is a deteriorating condition. Sure, oh, yeah. And at the point, uh, their days and nights are confused, and things yeah. begin to really fall apart. Mom yeah. thinks that the dish, uh, the, the the dish cloth is cabbage and is cooking right. it, yeah. and uh, or they don't know what the stove means mm -hmm. and and sure. create problems. Then you're now confronted with what we should do next. Yeah, and you know what happens too a lot of times is the caregiver, the, the spouse, it, it, it kills them, frankly. I, it's so I, hard on them. It, it, it is hard. Yeah. I, I can only imagine. Yeah. I've certainly over the years dealt with this, but my main concern is always what is going to happen with the caregiver. Yeah. 
watching the spouse or the parent mm -hmm. deteriorate, uh, watching with helplessness and many times hopelessness mm -hmm. about a condition that there is no answer to. Mm -hmm. It continues its downward uh, progression. Sure. So yeah. what are your recommendations? If I came in to you and I gave you a scenario um, and I said, listen, my, my, my father has Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease. It's, uh, I've tried to provide him with care. Mm -hmm. We have significant assets. Mm -hmm. uh, what would your response be? Well, I'll tell you, bef before I talk about planning options, let me kind of mention a few more basic things. Okay, that's fine. So, first of all, understand for a husband and wife, Medicaid looks at everything they both own. Okay. So if the husband goes to the nursing home, it doesn't matter if everything's in the wife's name. Okay. So it's all kind of marital property. Because that's misunderstood, too. Right. And then, our, and, and actually, it used to be different back before 1989. Mm -hmm. but that was a long time ago. So, uh, so that's kind of rule. And then, rule number one is $1,500 is our basic eligibility limit. Okay. The home is exempt for a married couple, not for a single person. If okay. you're single, uh, you have a 13-month kind of exemption period. But mm -hmm. it, after that, it's not exempt. Um, uh, one car for the community spouse is exempt. Uh, for a single person, you have a car, uh, one exemption uh, for a car only up to $4,500, which is funny because wow. <laughs> every time I say that. Wow, do you know any cars for $4,500? Well, it, it, you see, that number came into the law in 1970. Okay. And uh, we have something called inflation, which has never, they've never adjusted that number for inflation. Wow. <laughs> so it, so that it, all you get is a $4,500 car. Okay. Um, that's for a single person. Okay, and are they allowed to keep that car uh, car f in perpetuity or what? Well, they can they can have a, a car worth under forty five hundred dollars and still be eligible for Medicaid. Okay, now, as a patch, most people you know don't need that. But, right. Okay. Um, and then uh, also th there's what's called the community spouse resource allowance. Okay. So in addition to what I already mentioned, if you're the community spouse still at home, you're allowed to keep half of the total resources uh, up to a certain maximum. So and and they, they value that, as, as you know, the stock market's going up and down mm -hmm. every day and values yep. change. Mm -hmm. As of the first day you go into a nursing home, uh, you take kind of a snapshot mm -hmm. or balance sheet, mm -hmm. and then the community spouse can keep half, okay. but, but up to a certain maximum of approximately $113,000. Okay. So that's the most you'd get to keep. Plus the house. Plus the house and one car. And one car. Now right. the house, is that 100%? Or do, do, does the program state that there's a 50% interest to the... No, no, no. Okay, it's 100%. The whole house. And, and technically there is a, under the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005, there is a, uh, there's actually a home equity limit now, so it can't uh, exceed um, uh, approximately $500,000. Okay. But the real estate market was different when they passed that law. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Now, and, and frankly, I never see anybody in, in Dayton where we've had a house at that value that uh, we've been concerned about. Okay. And, and actually, even that, technically, for the community spouse, that limit doesn't apply anyway. Okay. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on okay. that. Okay. All so, right. So, so we have the community spouse resource allowance. Um, IRAs and pension plans are not exempt. Okay. The, Period. We, we kind of think they are because we hear that they're you know, tax-free and, mm -hmm. and, and they are protected from creditors. There's mm -hmm. some laws about that, but Medicaid counts them as long as it's if it's a pension balance that you have access to, it's countable. Now, so. if an IRA, is, it doesn't matter if it's in his name or her name because they're right. combining both they're under together. community spouse provisions. Correct. And that money, if it's, um, it, it shows as an asset that's available, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Wow. So that all, that all counts. That's major. Um, so uh, what, let me think, if I'm missing any other rules. Um, you know, generally anything you have a value is countable. So even life insurance, a lot of them have a cash value. Yeah. Now if it's just term, that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Term, term meaning it only pays yeah. when you pass away. Right. But some of them have a cash value. Okay, um, so they are allowed to keep and count term insurance whether it's jointly uh, benefits or uh, beneficiaries or him or her, it doesn't matter. Correct. Okay. Correct. What about children living at the home? Because many times parents are having to take care of handicapped children. Mm -hmm. That's an expense. Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that work? 
Well, I mean, in terms of the, the expenses matter, we're kind of, in terms of eligibility, we want to focus on assets. Okay. Um, the, actually, there are some, uh, we, we have to talk about the transfer rule, but just to okay. answer your question Alrighty. first. Okay. Uh, there are some exceptions where if you have a disabled child, mm -hmm. you can, are allowed to keep that house, even for a single person, and, and transfer it for the benefit of that disabled child. Really? So, So yeah. if you have a, 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 an individual who's taking care of a, a uh, challenged child, mm -hmm. an adult, then, and he or she has to go into a facility as a single person, mm -hmm. maybe a widow or widower, mm -hmm. but the child is there, then the child would have, um, that asset could, could, could transfer to the child? Correct. Oh, wow. Uh, assuming, That's nice. assuming they are disabled and okay. Medically officially validated. determined okay. by mm -hmm. Social Security to be disabled. Okay, great. But let's talk about the transfer rule because that's very important. And well, one, let's talk one, about one transfers. Most, one yeah. of the most common questions. You know, given everything I told you, you don't have to be real smart to, to say, well, why don't we just give everything to our kids yes, or give it away? Yes, yes. Well, if you, if you could do that, everybody would be on Medicaid. Yes, So yes. Medicaid has a rule that says if you give away money or property, which means transferring things to the uh, with children or other, whoever your family is, put in their name, uh, you're going to be ineligible for basically up to five years. The so Medicaid there's a five-year. They call it a five-year look back. Okay. So if you make gift transfers, you got five years where you're ineligible. And then the odd thing about this rule, I'd really kind of have to give you a numerical example to make it clear, but um, if I transfer money, if I transfer, you know, maybe just even $50,000, okay. and then I go to a nursing home, and I, I, I spend down, okay. and say I'm Two single, mm -hmm. I get below 1500 and I say, oh, well, I'll go apply for Medicaid. I apply for Medicaid because I'm below 1500 and they, and they look back within five years, they mm -hmm. see, oh, you gave away 50000 to your son. Now you're ineligible for starting now for the next, and the way they do it, they take, let's say it's 60000 they take 60000 and they divide by an official uh, penalty rate, they mm -hmm. call it. Uh, of, of 6,023. Mm -hmm. So you would now be ineligible for the next 10 months. Starting, or, wow. so not, not when you made the gift transfer, right. but starting when you apply for Medicaid and you're below 1,500. So now we got a 10 So now you're window. impoverished yeah. and you're ineligible. Correct. Am I not hearing right. that correctly? Correct. You're broke. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you are now ineligible yeah. for that 10 month period right. because of your gifting of this money to ch the that's child. Right. That's right. I don't think people know that. Uh, no, and a lot of times people, Medicaid presume you're making, an, they call it an improper transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, a lot of times people, they give their car to a grandchild or, mm -hmm. or, or people here, you can give away 10000 a year. It's actually 13 now, mm -hmm. but that's gift tax law. Medicaid has no exception for giving away 13000 a year. So people do that, and they're healthy. They're not thinking about a nursing home at mm -hmm. all. But then three years later, something happens. And um, there they are, yeah. and, and, stuck and, with that. And people ask me sometimes, they say, well, what's going to happen to this person? Are they going to get kicked out? And I said, well, yeah, they might. They, the the they nursing home doesn't, you know, they can't uh, just, you know, have people sitting there not getting paid. But what can happen is if that 60000 could be returned to mom, that undoes the penalty. Right. So that's a okay. potential solution. But if, it, it, but if it's gone, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you, you can't mm -hmm. return that. So the kid, so. if it's spent, then the children are going to have a dilemma for 10 months. Correct. In this particular yeah. illustration. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is now you might say, or the kids might say, well, we'll use that 60000 to pay the bill. That actually doesn't work. You'd have to do the math. Mm -hmm. But I can just tell you from doing it, experience, it doesn't work because uh, the penalty rate we're talking about, I yeah. said, with 60000 we divide by 6,023. It's about 10 mm -hmm. months. The problem is the nursing home, uh, at least around Montgomery County area, uh, will cost more than six thousand a month. Yeah, you know, it'll yeah. It'll probably be more like like eight thousand yeah, a month. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're going to use up that six thousand before you get through the ten months. So, so, what do you recommend? Well, well I, I recommend <laughs> they don't do the transfer. For right. Long. Sometimes people think that's a good plan. We'll we'll transfer and then we'll hope we get through five years. Well, that's mm -hmm. not good. Yeah. That's risky. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to mm -hmm. take a risk. Um, what, uh, here, I mean, here's, I'm going to have to give you a general answer. What I generally do for people, uh, because the answer is different for everybody. There's no simple answer. Right. If, if you go to an attorney or someone and they say, 
oh, you should do an annuity. Mm -hmm. And that's what they tell everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, or you should do a trust. Mm -hmm. And that just means that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily mm -hmm. what's best for you. Right. What's best for you is, is different. And what I do is I get people's financial information, mm -hmm. uh, copies of their bank statement, deeds, and all those things. Mm -hmm. That way I have accurate information in front of me. I review that, and then I prepare an asset protection plan based on an their asset circumstances. asset protection plan. Right. So okay. you know, based on their circumstances, I'll say, here's your, here's your options. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some examples. Um, I want to give you one example, which I like to give, because someone came to me a long time ago, and his wife went into the nursing home, and he was fairly young. I think he was in his 60s. Yeah, that's and, young. And uh, okay. they had, uh, they had a, a house, and he had a truck, and then I think about $30,000. Okay. Now, we, we talked about the resource allowance. Remember? Right, So he would right. be allowed to keep half of that 30000 Right. Uh, or actually, there's a minimum, but let's just mm -hmm. say that's half of the 30000 And you might think, well, you know, gee, well, I couldn't do much for him, or, mm -hmm. or it, it wouldn't be worth him paying me a lot of money. But I said, well, bring your things in, copies of, the, of all your information. I reviewed it, and I saw he had a, a $20,000 loan on that truck. Oh. And I said, I said, you hurry, you hurry up and go out and pay that off right away, and she's, she will be, she was eligible right away. Immediately. Yeah. Now he could have, <laughs> in paying off that truck, the thirty thousand dollars that they both had, mm -hmm. and that money could be used to pay, pay off, off the, the truck. truck. Right. And then there would not be a spend down because right. she's technically. Yeah, I mean, I saved him fifteen thousand. If he wouldn't have done anything, they would have told him at, at the Medicaid office to. You know, you got to spend fifteen thousand. Oh my gosh! So, but, that, that, but here he's financially better case. off because he's paid that's off. Nice. So I just give that example to show okay. that you don't have to have a lot of money to make it worthwhile. And 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 I didn't, it didn't take me much time, so I don't remember what my bill was. It wasn't mm -hmm, that much. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the and that's an example. Some of the simplest options are what I call a spend down plan. Okay. <coughs> so instead of, let's say you have to spend down $50,000. Mm -hmm. We do our numbers, you have to spend down 50, uh, we have a community spouse at home. Instead of just paying a nursing home bill, uh, you could do things like, like pay off a loan. Right. Maybe you have a home equity loan. Certainly mm -hmm. pay off any loans. Um, the community spouse could buy a new car. They might have an old car. Mm -hmm. And maybe they oh, don't right. maybe want a new right, car, but. Right, but right. Uh, are there so, are there uh, are there, re there caps on how much they can spend on a new car? There's there's technically no limit, but I say I say there's a reasonable limit. I don't right. think you go out buy a Rolls Royce. Yeah, or something that, like that. that's so a So there's bit a reasonable much. limit. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you could fix up the house, so you could hmm. put on a new roof or furnace. And the thing about some of these things. If you didn't do them, if you just spent 50000 on the nursing home, a year later, then you might have to get a new roof. Right. right. Or you and now or, you're out. Or again. you might need a new car mm -hmm. three years from now. So now, yeah, now you're out. So uh, so those, uh, those are what we call spend-down strategies. Okay. Uh, what about <coughs> buying in advance uh, burial? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's pr actually, that's the first thing, doing a, an irrevocable prepaid funeral plan. Okay. Uh, and that's almost, that's almost really the first thing because let's say someone's single mm -hmm. they're spending down they're below 1500 they're on medicaid then they pass away well that 1500 is not enough to, to pay for all no that. it is not so a prepaid funeral plan and a burial plot if you want to plot what about so, is that, that all, allowable? all that all, that's all those things uh, okay part of, so you can you can okay. prepay that okay um what about clothing and things for while you're personal in the items home. and for a single person too especially i say look you know does your dad need anything? Right. Does he need uh, glasses? Sometimes aren't covered by Medicare mm -hmm, or other mm -hmm, insurance, mm -hmm. or a nice chair. Or right. Personal, they need. Get him something personal. So. Um, that's but, that's yeah. very good information. Yeah. And then keep fifteen hundred. You know, you fifteen. You're allowed to keep fifteen hundred, mm -hmm. so you might as well keep fifteen hundred. Yeah. Um, so again, those are kind of what we call spend down strategies. So for a lot of people, that's just uh, you know a good thing to do. It just depends on the numbers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> some other things, uh, if, you're, if you're healthy, well, first of all, I really should say, and this is kind of more your area, really, okay. so you might want to say something, but the, the best thing for people to do when they're healthy is to get long-term care insurance. So, Can I, you know. would you say that again? <laughs> yeah. Because I, I am so, <laughs> I am so aggravated by the complete and total absence of reality thinking mm -hmm. for so many people. They yeah. don't believe it's going to happen to them. 
Yeah, and, and you know what I hear from people? Yeah. I don't sell insurance, uh -huh. but I always try to talk to people about when I, uh, the kind of reaction I get is, oh, I hear it's expensive. Uh, Why don't you... Uh, follow up and yeah find and i just out. say look it doesn't talk go talk to your financial planner it doesn't cost anything it, right it doesn't, and i say uh, the most i'll say i try not to give specific advice even though i i'm pretty familiar with policies i mm -hmm. just say look get the best you can afford exactly because some people uh, you know m maybe they can't afford a, a higher premium mm -hmm. uh, and i also tell agents be aware of that and just tell tell your uh, clients you know, look, if you tell me you can only budget 2000 a year for premium, well, mm -hmm. that's what we'll get for you. We'll get the mo most benefit for 2000 a year premium. And because there's variables you change. Of course. And, you know, and, and also, I would say, germane to what you're talking about, is that uh, the family needs to consider uh, funding the premium payment. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, it is a family matter. Sure. And the stress and the just the, the the just the dread of that thing happening, mm -hmm. and not having the funds in place to ensure um, highest quality care, yeah. as well sure. as under the Ohio Partnership Program, aren't those assets exempt then? Yeah, the newer policies now are part of what they call the partnership plan, and it basically gives people an additional we call like an exemption. Mm -hmm. and I'll give it a simple example. Let's say, let's say Fred buys an, an Ohio Partnership Plan long-term care policy, mm -hmm. and it pays two hundred thousand total benefit. Right. Uh, and he has he has three three hundred thousand of his own money. Right. He's single. Right. So he goes into the nursing home. It pays out that two hundred thousand. Okay. It's all used up. And then he has another 300000 himself. He doesn't have to spend down to 1500 He's allowed now to keep 200000 plus 1500 He spends down to 201500 and then he's eligible for Medicaid. And that 200000 can actually be a part of his, um, uh, the children's inheritance, correct? Well, yeah, there's two other benefits. So uh, he could also, we talked about the transfer. We can't, yes. You can't transfer things. Well, he, that's an exception. He would be allowed to give that to children or whoever he wants. That's powerful. And we haven't talked about estate recovery yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's also exempt from estate recovery. It is. So, so there's a real a big benefit to that. Um, Boy, but it's, it's kind of like, I, 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 at one level I said, we need to treat this like car insurance. <clears throat> Nobody likes to pay the premiums on car insurance until you're the one that gets crashed. Mm -hmm. You say, right. well, what's the probability of me getting hit? Ah, uh, 100% yeah. <laughs> when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. But in the interim, you carry it because it is sure it is insurance. It's just mm -hmm. an offset for risk. Same thing on homeowners. Mm -hmm. I, people say, how many times has my house burned down? I said, yeah. all it takes is one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> one right. time. Right. And then you're like, oh, am I ever glad I had insurance? So sure. um, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. But that's major, to be able oh, to yeah. exempt those large sums of money mm -hmm so that that can pass through to your family right. rather than seeing it pass away to the government. Exactly. I mean, right. that's, that to me is major. Well, yeah. continue. This is okay, good. Okay, so that's, a, that's really this. our first plan okay. is long-term right. insurance. Then our next plan is to look at some type of estate planning or asset protection planning in terms of Medicaid eligibility. And, uh, and first of all, people have two goals there. The most important goal for a married couple is they want to protect things for their spouse. Mm -hmm. You don't want your spouse to lose half of everything you got or more. Right. A um, uh, secondary goal is that people usually want to pass things on to their children or, mm -hmm. or, or nieces or nephews, whoever or they're Or churches or charitable. Mm -hmm, charitable. So that's kind of secondary. Um, I'll tell you, 90% of the people I do this kind of work for are in what I call a crisis situation. There, somebody's already in a nursing home or about ready to go. Oh, no. Y and you might not think there's anything we can do, but like I say, that, that's 90% of the people I do this mm -hmm. kind of work for. Mm -hmm. For the other 10%, if someone comes in and uh, maybe they can't get insurance because okay. of a health problem or they, or, or maybe they do get it, but they, they still won't, they're, it's not, they're not really getting a, a great policy. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most common things I do is set up an irrevocable, uh, I call it an irrevocable Medicaid trust. We put money in there and it's protected, it's exempt in terms of Medicaid. Okay. Now, of course, you can't just do that the day before you go on Medicaid. We have that five-year look back. Mm -hmm. So it's really only for someone who's relatively healthy, and we, we put money in there, and then it's protected. 
um, well, after we get through the five years. Okay. Now, I tell, I describe this trust to people. I say, well, you can't have your cake and eat it to you. You can't have your money in there, but you have full access yeah, to it. Yeah, right. So usually another family member is the trustee in charge of it. And also, people usually don't put everything in there. So if mm -hmm. you have, you know, two hundred thousand dollars state, you're not going to put everything in there. You, mm -hmm. You're going to keep, you know, twenty, forty thousand still in your own name. Right. And that, okay. that's just an individual choice for the person. I tell them, it's just whatever you feel comfortable with, you still want to have in, in your bank. Well, so. even with the look back provisions of five years, if you're setting up this um, Medicaid trust. Mm -hmm and you're naming a grandchild as the trustee, for an example, mm -hmm. and you do need to get money to live on outside of the money you have, is that an appropriate, can the grandchild disperse money out of the trust for you? Well, not, no, not really. I mean, okay. that, that's, like I say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Right, well, I got you. Now they can, oh, I'm sorry, you can reserve the income. So if you got okay. money in there, dividends or interest, yeah, you can get the income, okay. but not the principal. Can you reallocate those assets so that the income could potentially increase? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, the way I describe trust to people is, Think of a trust as a, like an umbrella over whatever you have. So okay. if you have a, a brokerage account or CDs, so yeah, you can buy and sell and change all that. Okay. But you're still in the trust. Right, okay. Right. Right. And with the trust being um, controlled under the aegis of someone else. The, whoever loving the trustee trusted, is. Yeah, loving yeah, right. trusted right. relationship. Right. That's right. a powerful vehicle, but you still yeah. are up into that yeah. five year. Yeah, and it's not for everybody, but, it, mm -hmm. but it, uh, you know, it's an option I present to some people. Okay. Um, another uh, common thing is, uh, is uh, for a married couple is an annuity. So okay. uh, it's a special type of annuity that under the, the Medicaid rules and regulations will be exempt. Uh, and well, for example, let's just say, let's just say we have a married couple mm -hmm. and they have $200,000 and they would normally have to spend down 100000 Right. Okay. Instead of spending it, uh, you could put a uh, uh, hundred thousand into a, a, a special type of annuity and it would mm -hmm. pay to the community spouse every month. You would meet your spend down and the, the other spouse would be eligible right away and that, that annuity payment goes to the community spouse, they'd be allowed to keep that. And the reason they would be allowed to keep that is because of the income threshold under that those program guidelines? No, it has nothing to do with the income threshold because it's a couple of reasons. First of all, the annuity has to be designed correctly under the rules okay. and regulations of Medicaid, and the income is paid to the community spouse. They're allowed, the, the community spouse is allowed to keep whatever income they have. And let me let me talk about the income oh rules. Oh my word! Yeah. Now, this is good. So far, we've talked about uh, resources or assets. Right. Exactly. There's also income rules, uh, and this is where the states differ. In a state like Colorado they do have an income limit and if mm -hmm. you're a dollar above it you're not eligible my goodness. ohio doesn't have that ohio, okay. ohio really doesn't have an income rule in terms of eligibility but after you're eligible there are rules so the um, the community spouse uh, they get social security or pension or mm -hmm. annuity income mm -hmm. they can keep all that doesn't matter what it is oh my goodness but then the nursing home spouse their income all has to go towards the nursing home so their pension mm -hmm. and social security has to go towards a nursing home bill, and then Medicaid picks up the rest. Okay, so there's no combining of income and splitting down the middle? Correct, the although scenario? there is, I want to mention what's called the monthly income allowance. Okay. You, you know, we, you can imagine you might have the high income spouse right. in the nursing home, and right. there's someone at home getting right. the widow. $400. I mean, yeah, yeah, 400 the wife, oh, yeah. right. So there, Medicaid has a, a, an allowance, and it, it's a kind of a complicated formula, but there's a formula that provides the community spouse with, with a certain minimum income. Okay. Now, I can't really give you the whole formula, but I'll just, what I tell clients is, it's not based on what you need, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. It, it, there's a minimum amount you get and that's it. So, okay. and I can just tell you from experience, it's never really, it's, people are used to living on two incomes and now they're losing part of it. So, you don't get much out of it. Mm-hmm. So, so that, even though the, the, the spouse at home has the house, has a car, they still have this issue of being able to live through a monthly income, mm -hmm. and that monthly income is only income that is for them, correct? Correct. So even if he has a pension, his pension 
cannot be used as an income for her. Correct. That his money is going to pay his bill. Yeah, except for the monthly income allowance, if anything you get in. Right. Out of that. So this is pretty important. If a spouse is going into a facility, mm -hmm. I would think that a properly structured um, Medicaid annuity mm -hmm. uh, that would income mm -hmm. would be very, very important. Sure, but now I don't like to call it income because it's really your principal. You're I really, got you. It's really turning your principal. Right, But right. since the income rules aren't that great, it's just more, that's why it's so important to save your principal. Yes, it is. Sure. It is. Now, if both, so that I'm clear, his money's being used to pay for his care and whatever the shortfall, Medicaid is meeting that shortfall. Correct. And yeah. by dispersing a yeah. check for the difference to the right. nursing home. Well, and, and technically, once you're on Medicaid, there's no nursing home bill. Medicaid has, they pay their rate. Uh, Medicaid sets the rate and sets the bill, basically. Okay. So it's that, that amount minus the uh, applicant's income. Okay, got yeah. it. And that's, the nursing home can, can say predictably that's cash flow coming in. Sure, yeah. Every month, yeah. uh, like clockwork. Right. That's a plus for them. But now we got the wife at home, mm -hmm. and she is struggling. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? Well, again, it, I mean, in terms of income, we can't really change a lot. We, it's just we mm -hmm. have to save as much of the resources as we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Before he uh, He's on Medicaid, is yeah. on Medicaid. Right, right. All this pre-planning is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I see the value in a person coming to see an individual such as yourself mm -hmm. who is a specialist in this very confusing and misunderstood mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Medicaid is a mess. Yeah, yeah. And people are angry because they're losing everything. The children feel mm -hmm. that this is a terrible, but with proper pre-planning, a lot of this could have been minimized, wouldn't you say? Sure, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well what are some other areas? Well, I'll tell you one of the things we want to talk about too is uh, veterans benefits. Okay. Because that kind of interacts with Medicaid. Um, veterans should be aware that, uh, you know, there's lots of, I got a big book with all kinds of veteran benefits and I don't deal with most of that, but I deal with veterans benefits in the context of long-term care. Right. So there's a, what, there's a benefit called aid and attendance. Right. So if you need uh, long-term care, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you might be eligible for this benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but some of the criteria are, first of all, you have to have had 90 days of active service, one of which has to have been during wartime. Mm -hmm. So you have to have been, you don't necessarily have to have been at war, you know, mm -hmm. you, there's lots of different roles, but you have to have been active during wartime. You could have been in the States or wherever. Right, right. Um, there are, med er, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the VA has its own income and, and resource limits as well. Uh, they're not as clearly defined as Medicaid, unfortunately. I know. The I'm general asset limit mm -hmm. is, is, is like $80,000. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a guideline, mm -hmm. they call it. Um, but so uh, let's say someone is in an assisted living facility. Okay. And that's the most common thing. Uh, if they can meet all those criteria, you would apply for this benefit, and you might get up to you know $1,800 a month or so if you qualify. Tax-free. Yeah, tax free, right? Nice. And so that in assisted living, considering the cost of assisted living, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. If you're in a nursing home, that's not going to pay too much of the bill. Right. I mean, there's, if you right. can get it, you want to get it, but it's not going to solve your problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also a benefit if you're at home. Those, my experience is, those are difficult to get. It doesn't okay. mean you shouldn't try, mm -hmm. but you have to prove you're homebound and can't mm -hmm. get out at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some things to be aware of. So, so that. My experience is people in the assisted living level, that's most helpful for Okay. Them. But again, we ha like Medicaid, we can have to spend down according to the VA rules. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the thing people have to be careful on, because uh, I, I see there's a lot of uh, VA benefits advisors out there mm -hmm. that have heard things like, oh, you can set up an irrevocable trust mm -hmm. for VA benefits, just kind mm -hmm. of like I already talked about. Uh, and so uh, people will go out and do that and they could, to get below the 80,000. Right. And uh, they could do that and be eligible the next day. Right. Which is contrary to what right. I said before uh, about right. Medicaid. Right. About Medicaid the five has that years. transfer mm -hmm. rule. Right. Uh, the uh, VA has no transfer rule. That's so you, amazing. So you could transfer, you don't even have to do a trust. You could transfer things or do a trust, get below 80,000 and be eligible, which sounds great. 
Yes. Uh, people think it's great, but it, it, it's not because if, if I have someone, a client who has Alzheimer's, they're in assisted living, mm -hmm. and then we set up this kind of trust, it's very predictable they will, will uh, get worse. Yeah. And so, so let's say three years later, now they go up to assisted living, and we have to apply for Medicaid, they're not going to be eligible because of the, the Medicaid rule. Right. So we have to think about, uh, in our planning options, we have to not get carried away with, focusing only on the BA benefit mm -hmm. and doing transfers or, or trust, mm -hmm. whatever we do, to just focus on that and not looking into the next five years and thinking what's going to happen. Well, I think, and, and this is powerful because I do think the aid and, and attendance benefit for veterans is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it is a godsend for many people who have limited resources. Mm -hmm. But you brought up such a point, and it got my attention mm -hmm. because I was like, Jeez, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> That's significant. Yeah, sure. Um, what would you recommend in that For, type of a scenario? You're talking about the veterans? Yeah. We really have to do, and it's difficult, we really have to look at the person's condition and think, gee, is this person going to make it through five years? Some uh -huh. people might be at a very early stage of Alzheimer's or, or have some other medical mm -hmm. condition where we feel pretty comfortable that um, that they could get through five years. Yes. So if that's the case, and ultimately that's really kind of the client's decision because mm -hmm. I can't predict that. But uh, if we feel comfortable with that, then we might do an irrevocable Medicaid trust mm -hmm. or some type of transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, with the understanding that the guidelines under VA, under the aid and attendance, mm -hmm. are not at all comparable to the guidelines <laughs> under Medicaid. Right. They're, they're and, and, and there has to be a real crispness yeah. in that planning to make sure that the client does not get uh, adversely hurt, yeah. wouldn't you say? Sure. And, and, and actually, I will say, you say, what would I recommend? Well, again, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, generally, we can do the same type of planning strategies with Medicaid. So I mentioned okay. trust, right. spend down, right. uh, fix up the house kind of thing, um, or an annuity. So we can generally do this kind of thing, right. same thing. That is extremely yeah. powerful. Yeah. Now, you have to do that before you apply for benefits because there's some, some rules of the VA that um, uh, once somebody applies for benefits, I can't really advise them or represent mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just there's kind mm -hmm. of odd rules in that. But beforehand, we can do the same type of planning. Right. Then we go in and we apply. And it's the same for Medicaid because I, I get this all the time. Even last week, uh, someone said, well, the nursing home told me to go apply for Medicaid right away. Well, they do that all the time. And <laughs> people go down there and they just waste their time. Right. So right. you want to get get some legal advice first right then we figure out what your plan is then when when I say I know now you're eligible now we go apply you know what and and I say this having been a practitioner for 36 years plus I continue to be so incredibly appreciative of the insight and the wisdom that individuals such as yourself as attorneys bring to the whole elder mm -hmm. uh, counseling process mm -hmm. and the legal because so much of it is driven by law mm -hmm. and people many times get involved without understanding the critical need for an elder law attorney sure. versus a general practitioner and I'm not going to speak against your industry because that mm -hmm. would just be totally yeah. uh, illogical but I do feel and I have counseled seniors and their children to retain services of an elder law mm -hmm. attorney and and be prepared to to pay because the dollars that you will save from proper legal counsel and mm -hmm. guidance and of course, you know, we work in tandem with you, mm -hmm. and this is an um, uh, awesome thing. But um, I just think that if we can leave people with one good piece of advice, mm -hmm. I would have to say that the whole area of nursing home long-term care mandates that you uh, investigate mm -hmm. and retain services of a uh, certified um Elder, elder law, law attorney, attorney. Yeah. just as a not even a negotiable yeah. 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 because sure. as an advisor I can't give the level of assistance mm -hmm. that 
pertaining to law mm -hmm. that you've been trained to do. Sure. And the most important thing, too, is I think it's hard to get people in, the, in terms of planning, estate planning, because we, we have to think about unpleasant things. We have to we think do. about, gee, what happens when I die, or what if I go to a nursing home? Because a lot of people, their reaction is, well, I'm not going to a nursing home. I, uh, so I've we, never, you never you met a person to, in yeah, a nursing to, home yeah. that oh, thought yeah. they would be there. Yeah, I'm yeah. so serious. Yeah, but what, one of the things I say about estate planning in general is, we, we plan for the worst and we hope for the best. Yes. So you don't want to go to a nursing home and you, well, you don't want to die. We know we'll die someday. But we, we want to think about those things, do our plan, and then forget about it and, and, and hopefully uh, be fine and stay home the rest of your life. Well, on that note, um, viewers, we are, are going to conclude today's segment of The Power of Money with my guest, uh, Michael J. Milanag, attorney at law and uh, a um, uh, elder law uh, specialist, one of the super lawyers in the state of Ohio by his peers. And I hope the information we've shared with you today on protecting your assets from nursing home seizure has given you some thought. I hope you do not sit back having gotten this information and not begin to look at your own circumstances in your families so that you can plan ahead. Nothing is worse than facing a tragedy without proper planning. And this whole nursing home crisis, and it is a crisis, will require very thorough pre-planning. I bid you a great and wonderful day, and as always, God bless you, and I'll see you on our next segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, Michelle Graves. You take care.